Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome to Intentional Conversations podcast. We're just giving it a moment or two for people to get settled into this virtual learning space. So whether you're joining us live on LinkedIn or live actually in the Zoom room, we are so glad you're here. We've been expecting you. I want to ask that you please take a moment to go to the chat. Let us know where you're joining the conversation from today. It's always a treat for us to know where people are visiting from. And if you also feel inclined, feel free to share anything else into the chat, maybe perhaps your LinkedIn information, which lets us know that you are interested in connecting with this community even beyond this hour of time that we're going to spend together today. I am Dr. Nika White. My pronouns are she, her, hers, founder and principal consultant for NWC. And I do want to shout out my team, Nika White Consulting. They work very hard to ensure that this virtual community experience through our podcast is one that people walk away feeling like it was time well spent. And so I am always grateful for their help, their support. And uh, we just appreciate you being here with us today. I want you to know that cameras are um, encouraged, but certainly not required. So feel free to engage in whatever capacity that feels comfortable for you. We do have closed caption that's enabled today, and that is for the benefit um, of those who may need it. Also, it's our way at NWC and exercising great deal of respect for disability inclusion. And so we hope that you will take advantage of that if it's needed. I want to invite you to make sure that not only do you go to that chat to share where you're joining us from, but let's use that chat as a way to help us get proximate to each other as we learn with and from each other during this hour of time together. So if there's a resource um, that comes to mind that you feel like would be of value to this community, then you know what to do. Share it into the chat. Um, and we will definitely make sure that we amplify all of the goodness that's going to come by way of your contributions to today's experience. Experience. So once again, this is Intentional Conversations Podcast. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Dr. Nika White, and I, this is Intentional Conversations Podcast, and this is where we just come together in community and we are discussing and intersecting diversity, equity, and inclusion belonging along with leadership and business. And so we're so glad you're here. We've been expecting you. And um, we look forward to a great hour of wonderful conversation with our guest co-host that I will introduce momentarily. I also want to let you know that next week we're going to be into the month of February, and that is Black Heritage Month, Black History Month. And so we're celebrating all things Black heritage. And I want you to know that at NWC, we do have some curated Black History Month experiences that we would love to be able to engage your organization organization in. So if you've waited a little late or you're trying to make sure you can pull something off that's meaningful and certainly celebratory of Black joy, Black excellence, we would love to be a part of helping you to bring that experience to your organization. So just reach out to us, let us know, and um, we look forward to being in conversation with you. And I am so excited because we are soon on the pub date of my book, January 31st, I, although I will tell you that many people have already begun to receive their copy. I am so, so grateful, 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 grateful to all of you who've been supporting me on this journey. Um, this is in partnership with Forbes book. It is entitled Inclusion Uncomplicated, a transformative guide to simplify DEI and orders are being taken now. And then on January 31st, you can also go and get your copy anywhere that you like to purchase purchase your books, or of course, on Amazon. And so again, just really grateful for the support. As I'm talking about this book launch, I also want you all to be aware of two separate opportunities where you can join us for a book launch celebration. If you're in the local market of Greenville, South Carolina, the upstate of South Carolina, you can join us in person. 
we will be having an in-person book launch event where I will be there on site signing books and lots of other activities are going to be taking place. That's going to be February the 9th from 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, my colleagues are going to actually place into the chat a link for you to register for that. It is no charge. Just want you to come and celebrate with me and let me show my appreciation for all of your support. And we know that this vodcast community, you come from all over. We even have some international community members that join us pretty uh, repetitively. And so I want you to know that we did not leave you out. There will be a virtual book launch celebration event next week on February the 2nd. That's actually going to be co-hosted by my friend, Minda Hartz, author of the memo right within um, wonderful, wonderful person that's a practitioner in this space as well. And so that event is also free. We will be placing the link into the chat for the virtual opportunity. So register. You can register for um, either one of these that best fits your situation, but we just want you to be in celebration with us. And we're grateful for you to even consider this opportunity. And for those of you who are also interested in going more in depth, there will be what we're referring to as a book club-ish type of opportunity, where it's going to be live discussions with me, the author. Um, my colleague, Cosette Strong, is actually going to be co-facilitating that with me. But we're going to start delving deep into unraveling inclusion uncomplicated, some of those concepts in the book. And um, I hope that you will consider that opportunity as well. The link will be placed into the chat. And so that's April the 20th. It gives you time to get the book, read the book. Or if you don't have the opportunity to complete the book, then certainly you will um, be able to participate and engage nonetheless. And so I wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Lots of exciting things that were coming up. We shared um, early in this month that we were launching a new website for Nico White Consulting, and we have done just that. So this is our way of just, you know, sharing and inviting you to go check it out. Lots of new ways we've streamlined the website, added some new content, some new products and services, and would love for you to give us your feedback. And so that's simply NicoWhite.com, and we thank you in advance. Now, we like to also give you a head nod as to what you have to look forward to. While sometimes we do have scheduling changes that we accommodate for, um, it's just important sometimes for people to know who's coming up next as the co-host on Attentional Conversations. And so you'll see there's some names and dates. If you don't know these individuals, they're wonderful practitioners in this space. And so I invite you to look them up on LinkedIn and mark your calendars accordingly to join us for weeks to come as we, again, delve into conversations where we're intersecting DEI with leadership and business. Now, for all of you who've been a part of this community for quite some time, you know that we spend an opportunity before bringing on our guest co-host to provide a formal introduction. We want you to know their accolades, their credentials, how in which they're showing up to this space. And I am so excited because this is a hometown girlfriend. Um, I love being able to highlight local talent, local individuals, and Giovanna is someone who's doing some amazing things right here in our community, but beyond. I mean, she's physically in our community, but she certainly is um, addressing all types of opportunities um, with people all over. And so I look forward to being in conversation with her. So I'm going to read her bio that I'm going to invite her to share and greet um, in her own way, whatever type of words um, that she wants to lead us into for this audience today. Born and raised in upstate South Carolina, Giovanna Burgess Gathers is a dynamic solution focused change agent who is incredibly passionate about the field of personal and professional transformation. As a clinically trained psychotherapist, life and business coach, trainer, consultant, stress management expert, and emotional intelligence expert, Giovanna Stahl is described as practical, relatable, insightful, and transformational. Her clients describe her as genuine, honest, professional, and transparent. They also report having confidence in her ability to utilize her 30 years of knowledge, experience, training, skill, and expertise, along with evidence-based techniques and proven approaches to help them achieve their desired outcomes and create lasting change in their lives. Giovanna also leads seminars, webinars, retreats, trainings, workshops, and delivers keynotes and guest speaking addresses. In the fall of 2016, she began teaching deep breathing techniques for self-care, relaxation, and stress management, and founded 
the Breathe Facebook group, group and the Breathe Retreat for Women and the Breathe Women's Conference. She is a two-time author, having published her first book in 2017, Why Am I Still Single, which was selected and featured at the 2018 and 2019 Essence Festival Bookstore in New Orleans. Her second book, Epiphany, was released in October of 2020. In 2021, Giovanna added the title of international speaker to her credits after being featured speaker on the Live Your Best Life Tour in Nairobi, Kenya, and receiving the Dr. Estelle Collins Global Inspiration Award. Through her many engagements, Giovanna always strives to connect with people in ways that are impactful, meaningful, transformational. She is also happily married, mother of two, who loves to read, write, exercise, travel, and spend time with family and friends. Giovanna has been featured in Sheen Magazine, Rolling Out Magazine, Courageous Woman Magazine, Glambitious Magazine, Black Enterprise, and also in the My CEO Magazine and the Huff Post. Podcast community, you know what to do now. Let's take to our chat or let's find those emojis, find those reactions. And please, as I stop sharing my screen, help me to welcome my friend Giovanna and um, place whatever type of greetings you would like to into the chat to let her know that we're so grateful that she has said yes to our invitation and that she's here sharing with us today. We are thrilled, Giovanna. So thank you, my friend. How are you? Thank you. I am doing well. A little bit rushed this morning, but doing well. And thank, <laughs> you. <laughs> thank you, Nika, so much. I was so excited when I received your, your invite to be a guest on the show the other day. Thank you. Oh, you're absolutely welcome. I think that we're going to be the beneficiaries after reading all of your accolades. I mean, I know you, but I wanted this community to have full knowledge of all of the greatness that you bring to the work in the spaces that you serve in. And so we're so grateful that you said yes to our invitation. So I'm not gonna let you off the hook, Giovanna. One of the things that we like to do uh, before we jump, jump into all of our conversations is to ask our guest co-host to share with us something we would not know about you by visiting your LinkedIn profile or even reading your bio. So now you're gonna have to get a little bit better connected with us so we can understand a little bit more about you. So what do we not know about you, Giovanna, that you can share? Nika, this is actually a funny one that I utilize a lot when I'm speaking or facilitating um, because it's a way for me to, to get to know them as well. But um, little known fun fact about me is that I won my high school talent show as a rapper. I used to rap. I used to, <laughs> I had my own DJ. I, I mean, I traveled, like I was booked as a performer when I was between high school and college. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That is so fun. That is a very, very fun fact that I would never have guessed. And I feel like I know you because, you know, again, we're in the same market, same town. Yeah. Um, but that is a fun fact. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay, so we're going to jump right in. I do have um, lots of things that I want to engage you in today. Um, and I want to just first start with um, the, all the different generations that we have in the workforce right now. I know this is something that you're really passionate and interested in, and you often speak on it. So um, with the five generations in the workforce, of course, we have Gen Z, the millennials, Gen X, boomers, traditionalists. How does this affect the current work environment and culture from your vantage point, Giovanna? Well, wow. and, and let me say this too, to be totally transparent, I am so new to this whole DEI space, um, but, you know, because I've done so much speaking and, and yeah. workshops and facilitating, it really kind of became a natural segue in some ways. So I feel like I'm still learning like a lot of what, what is all involved in this space, but but one of the things that I have spoken about quite often is generational diversity. And as you said, you know, perhaps for one of the first times um, in history, or it's been mm -hmm. very long, we have five generations in the workspace. And as much as that brings with it, I think, some conflict and 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 people want to just kind of hold on to, to what they know and what they're used to and what they're familiar with and what's comfortable. I think it offers us so many incredible opportunities as we embrace and harness what each of those different generations has to offer. Um, I, for one, I have children, you have younger children, older than mm -hmm. mine, but 
you know, I don't think I could navigate around half of my devices if it wasn't for my children. And, and so I'm just open to that. I'm open to younger people learning from them. And I really try to encourage other people to be open to that, to each generation. Also working with the younger generation to be open to those of us who are a little more seasoned. Um, right. Because I just think we grow. I think the more we we broaden our horizon and what we're willing, the conversations we're willing to have, the you know the more robust um, our, our conversations become, mm-hmm. and I think just the more that we grow and expand as individuals. I totally agree. And something that you are alluding to is that whole rever- reverse mentoring, right? You know, sometimes we tend to think about a more seasoned person being the one that's pouring into the younger, you know, you know, professional or individual. And now we're seeing um, this trend of reverse mentoring, which is really to say we all have something to offer, right? And so Absolutely. let's not forget the opportunities for that to be a two-way street. I want to go back to something that you kind of prefaced as you were starting to answer this question. And that is, you know, you said, I'm kind of new to this space. What I I love about the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging is that it is not vertical, but it is horizontal. It mm-hmm. expands across every organization, every sector, every environment, right? And I think there is such a logical connection point to the work that you do, especially when I think about how you were so focused and you continue to be focused on um, you know stress management because the well-being right now mm-hmm. is a hot topic in this broad conversation of DEI because it has to be not only because people have been um, you know really displaced and challenged by having to navigate the complexities of the pandemic right but then on top of that we've seen over the past few years some really significant um, social injustices that have hit people incredibly hard even as recent as in you know this week last week I mean it's 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 seems like it's a daily occurrence. Mm -hmm. And so that self-preservation, self-relaxation, stress management, I think it's, it does tell directly into the center of the conversation of inclusion and well-being and um, standing in solidarity and being allies for each other. And so I just wanted to bring that to the conversation because, yeah, I've loved how you've expanded the work that you were doing to be able to make sure that now this message of DEI is right in the center of it. And you've done that incredibly well, which is kind of what led to us wanting to get you on to share with our community today. So talk a little bit about your journey and, um, and how you got started and some of the ways in which you really like to show up to um, the work that you do? Well, let me just say, I I just recently celebrated 10 years in private practice on January. Congratulations. Congratulations. 10 years years is no small feat at all. (laughs) (laughs) 10 years when I think back to where I started, wow, it seems like, it seems like more like 15. Um, But certainly there's been a lot of growth and opportunities during that, that space. But as you were speaking, I was just thinking back to when I first Um, went out into private practice. And of course, I had been in organizational management. And so I just knew that I was going to jump into the corporate space and the organizational space and bring in soft skills. But I think 10 years ago, companies were not as interested in soft skills as they are today. And so I slowly just sort of, you know, decided to dedicate myself to what I was good at, what I was trained as, which was the field of mental health and psychotherapy. And and then I was doing also some coaching on the side. Um, And But now when I look at where we are and I look at the demand, not only for mental health in the personal perspective, but now that we are talking about emotional intelligence and and inclusion and belonging, Longing, and we are having those conversations around what does it really take to create a safe workspace environment that's psychologically safe. That excites me because finally, I think there is becoming this intersection between neuroscience and psychology. And absolutely, it's almost like it didn't make sense to me that it wasn't always there because I have a favorite phrase um, from a book everywhere I go, there I am. So I can't always Mm. separate who Giovanna is when I walk through the doors of the workspace. Whatever I'm dealing with, whatever past things have had an effect on me, those things are just going to get played out in the workspace. So how we separated that and would tell people, leave all that at the door when you come to work, really, I think, did a lot of people an injustice. And I'm just glad that now we're doing better at embracing that concept and, and, and embracing the idea that 
our people are our greatest resource. Without our people, mm-hmm. you know, when we look at COVID and the whole great resignation, and, and then you had companies who all of a sudden now they're offering $20 an hour that that probably previously offered $10 yeah. an hour. And you ask yourself, why weren't you able to offer that before? Um, because companies were enjoying a higher profit margin. But the great resignation taught companies that, look, if you don't have people and you don't have associates and employees, you don't have a business. So you've you got have a business. To deal, you know, to come up with those incentives to get people to want to come in the door. And I think people are now doing a better job at demanding what they're worth. So I'm just excited about how DEI plays in that, especially when it comes to, you know, diversity. Obviously, I'm an African American woman, um, but also, uh, you know, in the generational space. And of course, there are so many other um, assets or facets of, of diversity. Mm-hmm. But, but also with inclusion and people having a sense of belonging and those things just go right back to psychology and they go they right back to personal human development. Like no matter what your title is, you're a human first. And so how you're navigating that space obviously has a great impact on how you navigate everything else, relationships, your marriage, you know, your health, everything. So well stated. Yes, you are human first. I think about, you know, that that phrase human resources. I think sometimes the amplification is on the resources portion, but not enough on the human aspect, right? Which is precisely what you're talking about. Uh, you you had a statement that you said is one of your, your, your mantras that you use often. I want to make sure I get this correct because I thought it was so well stated. Everywhere I go, there I am. I want to dig into that a little bit deeper because, you know, to your point, I think that it has everything to do with the sense of belonging, right, that we talk a lot about in the space of DEI and the need to show up confidently, knowing that you're seen, you're valued, you're heard, and that you belong there. And so, um, you know, you you gravitated towards that because obviously you're bringing it up today. You say that you mention it a lot. What did that do for you when you heard that and how has it transformed and helped shape perhaps how in which you coach and you interact with others? I think first and foremost, just, you know, when I'm facilitating, I, my husband made a statement to me that I hadn't considered because I love personal and professional development. But one day he said to me, he said, honey, people don't want to go to training. And I thought they don't <laughs> because yeah. I love the whole training and coaching and facilitating space. And so when yeah. he told me that, he said, so you've got to be engaging and you've got to give, give them a reason to want to stay. So one of the things that I do by setting the tone immediately is asking them to be present. Like we come into agreement that I'm going to be present and I need you to be present. That means putting your phone away, letting those emails wait. I always give break so they have that time to cram and check those emails and respond to text messages but be present and I think that's one of the main things I love about that that phrase which is actually the title of a book but if my feet are here let me be here let my mind be here you yeah. know think about like mindfulness that's basically what right. that is and one of the things I often share is that, you know, when you think about pets, you know, your your animals, I don't know if you have fur babies, but I, I do. Have- I have a fur baby. <laughs> <laughs> I have a shout gorgeous, out to Winter, Winter White. <laughs> I have a gorgeous little brindle Shih Tzu named Zoe, who thinks she's alpha of the whole house. But in any event, when Zoe is engaged in an activity, she is one hundred percent focused and present on whatever that activity mm. is. If you notice small children playing, yep. they are one hundred percent engaged in what they're doing. But when we become adults, our focus becomes less on the present and what we're doing and either we're stuck in the past and worrying about something we could have would have should have done or we're worrying about the future and so mindfulness and being present everywhere you go that's where you are so who I am outside of this workspace also becomes who I am in the workspace it becomes who I am in my relationships you know Nika you think about uh, from a relationship perspective, in my first book, Why Am I Still Single? I talk mm-hmm. about how people bring their relationship representative in the beginning. When people interview for a job, they're going to bring their best, best self to that interview. Yeah. They're not yeah. going to tell you that sometimes I'm late. Sometimes, you know, I start off strong and then I, you know, I get pretty mm-hmm. weak after that. They're going to bring their, their best self. But over time, you're going to get to see the many different faces of that person when they're yeah. 
Yeah. When they're frustrated, when, you know, when things don't work out the way that they plan, then you get to see the whole person. So again, it just goes back to everywhere I go, there I am. And how do I want to show up? in that space you know if it, it you we think it too about like having a personal brand i'm doing this yeah. course with um dean graziosi and tony robbins and one of the things that dean often talks about is your personal brand you know in that when you're not look when people aren't looking is my integrity the same when someone's not watching me as it is when i'm doing a vodka right. as it is when right. i'm on stage as it is when i'm standing in front of a room facilitating is Giovanna's personal brand going to be the same? Like if, if someone was watching me and I didn't know they were watching, are they still going to see that she's transparent? Are they still going to say that she's genuine? Are they still going to be able to say the same, same things about me in and outside of that professional space? Yeah, what you're speaking to um, as you're addressing that consistency is the authenticity. And that is something that so many leaders, I believe, um, lack. And it is actually one of the, the, the biggest ways to gain trust, right, of the people that are in your circle and your network and that you're working with is to allow yourself to be authentic and vulnerable. And so I love that you are um, em emphasizing the need for us to show up consistently. Um, you also, you use, I love, I love words and language and you said facilitating space. And so I'm kind of with your husband. I'm not big on the word training because I do think that it has a certain feel about it. We often say it in WC experiences, learning experiences, but I also love, I'm facilitating space. And that space can be a multitude of different types of experiences based upon how and which you're showing up and what you want to get out of that, um, that experience. And so I love that. So you introduced mindfulness, and obviously that is a big part of your work. Mm -hmm. I remember when you first, years ago, when you were first introducing your Breathe Conference, there was so much chatter about it, so much excitement. And so tell me about why mindfulness is so important, and what are some strategies that you share with individuals to help them to become more mindful, especially when they're trying to you know, calm their anxious hearts and quiet their minds to be able to be more present and in the moment and available? Yeah. Believe it or not, Nika, I have been blessed. And, and I say the word blessed, even though that's not always a great corporate word to refer to, but I say blessed in that I have been able to bring my authentic self. And I don't pretend to be a human resources person or pretend to have 20 years of experience with C-suite individuals. I am new to this space and I bring a wealth of information about mindfulness and neuroscience and psychology and people, you know, human and behavior. And so I, I don't try to compete with someone else in that lane. I try to stay in my lane. And mindfulness is definitely one of those areas where I feel like I've been able to translate what I do with psycho, you know, with mental health clients into the corporate space and people are eating it up. I mean, it is just fascinating for me to see. And, and of course, we don't get into a lot of personal stuff. I don't mean that. But I give them permission to just come in the room and be safe. It is psychologically safe in this facilitation space, the mm -hmm. same way that I create that psychological safety in the therapy space. And, and so by doing that, I feel like I'm able to really get to the heart of what people are really dealing with. They're not just putting on the work face. They're not just putting on, you know, that corporate persona that I have it all together. But man, when five o'clock hits, I fall completely apart. Or when I get home, my spouse gets this terrible version of me because I've been pretending all day. I've been performing all day. So now my spouse gets the worst of me. They get yeah. silence or they get, you know, shortness or, 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 you know, I'm distracted or whatever. So I really try to encourage people practice mindfulness. Again, be where you are um do those things that that create that for you because that's going to be different for everyone else i play music when i'm speaking and facilitating that's a huge deal um and when you mentioned going back to the breathe conference i remember when i first came out with that people were saying what does she mean breathe i breathe every day i'm breathing every minute what are you talking about and what i'm also always talking about is intentional breathing conscious breathing where we're mm -hmm. using the breath and if you don't mind before we end, I'd like to show everybody a very quick breathing technique that works in minutes, and it is so powerful and effective. I have taught this to 
thousands of clients. Let me just say that in across multiple different disciplines. But um, but yeah, so the 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 concept of deep breathing, my breath is always there. It's always available to me. I don't have to go to an ashram. I don't have to wait until my Tuesday night yoga class or you know my morning meditation. Like right. my breath is always present. So utilizing that when you're in those stressful situations, when you're in conflict um, discussions, you know, going into those more centered and grounded so you can speak from an authentic place. So you can speak from a place of being centered and you're not just reacting and acting out, you know, that that emotional reaction, acting out of that amygdala and, and you're just, you know, um, uh, what is the word I'm trying to say? Again, you're just having an emotional reaction. Right rather than having a well thought out response. Yeah. So oh, absolutely. That is so rich. That is so rich. There's definitely a difference between reacting and responding. So I love that you bring that to the conversation. So listen, you've already invited this and we're not going to go any further until you give us okay. this breathing technique that you've already introduced. And so <laughs> I'm ready for it. I think this audience is ready for it. Take us through it and then we'll proceed with our conversation. Right. So go for it. Okay, absolutely. Um, so I'm, before I say that, I saw where somebody said mindful versus fight or flight. And yeah. absolutely, that is exactly what we're talking about. When that amygdala gets triggered, it gets hijacked, those emotions start flooding our brains, they basically shut down any higher cortex level of thinking, which is why a lot of times we just react, we feel triggered, that word trigger, which I tell them it's always, it's just like a gun, you know, the gun is what, the trigger is what releases the bullet from the gun, and when we are emotionally triggered by something someone says or does, someone didn't respond to our email in time, then that sometimes causes an emotional reaction in us, that sometimes Mm -hmm. isn't even rational you know it's they might yeah. think, why is she having that reaction to me not answering her email immediately but it's maybe because I grew up feeling like I was often ignored or overlooked or that I wasn't seen or heard and so now when my colleague doesn't respond immediately it triggers that old reaction but Let's talk yeah. about this breathing technique. Yeah, <laughs> I love this. I mean, again, and these are techniques that I think that we all can use because conflict is going to exist. Where there's people, there's going to be conflict. And conflict is not always bad. There's such thing as healthy conflict. But then I also think about those who are part of these workspaces, particularly those professionals who are part of the marginalized communities where they're often experiencing microaggressions, micro inequities, micro invalidations. And so we need these techniques. Okay, we're ready. All right. <laughs> So what I would like everyone to do before we start is just think about where you are right now, your stress level. You don't have to tell me. You can put it in the chat if you would like. Um, one to 10, one being I'm pretty chill right now, um, zero probably asleep, but but 10 being I'm pretty stressed or, you know, I'm I'm just, you know, I'm antsy or I'm anxious or my anxiety. I'm waiting for this podcast to end because I've got a ton of things to do. So just be honest with yourself. Let me know kind of where you are now, just so that you have a baseline. And then once we do this, technique, then I want you to just be able to compare and see where, where you are. Did it come down at all? So this is very simple, but it does, again, it's evidence-based, but all you're going to do is take, it's almost too simple. So people question whether it works, um, but you're going to take your, your index finger. And I just use my right hand because I'm right-handed, but it doesn't matter if you use your left hand, but you do want to slightly press down on your right nostril. That of it, that part of it, it is important. So it doesn't matter which mm -hmm. finger, right or left, but it is That's the right. right muscle. And you just want to gently press down on that. And then you want to just try to breathe as slow and deeply as you can. And once we're finished, then I can tell you guys the science behind that. So um, okay. Nika, how long do you want us to take? And if you're right. uncomfortable being on camera doing it, feel free to turn your camera off just so that you can truly get the benefit of this. But you do not get to go to sleep on us. All right. <laughs> so we're, we're bringing our authentic okay. selves. And so I'm going to stay on camera. Okay. 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 All right. All right. And you tell All us right. how long. I don't know. We're okay. following you. Okay. Let's, let's try to do, let's try to do two minutes. Just give me a second. Let me put okay. my, my timer on if you don't mind. I, I was thinking you were going to say like 30, 60 seconds. You're saying two minutes. Okay. Well, you really can start to notice the benefit in 30 seconds. But the reason okay. I typically say, um, 
a minute to two is because again, some people were saying seven and eight. When your um, stress level is that high, it, it sometimes is going to take a few minutes before you start nice. to see the, the benefit. But let's do a minute and just see if there's any change whatsoever. But I would also encourage people when you get time alone and you're not feeling self-conscious on camera, definitely practice three to five minutes. And it, it's better than a glass of wine <laughs> um, it, You know that we use sometimes to unwind you're just going to feel this incredible sense of calm come over you all right so i think i think um, some folks have already started terry did oh, you already oh. start <laughs> okay anyway we're ready if okay. you're already doing it terry then you're probably already starting to feel it um okay try again to calm down as much as possible relax any tension in your body um again if you have glasses on you may want to remove them just so you can be more comfortable uh but here we go one minute of just deep conscious breathing through our right not through our left nostril sorry all right again remember to breathe deep and slow Yeah, relax, release any tension. If your thoughts are wandering, it's okay. Five, four, three, two, one. And how are you doing? Drop those numbers in the chat for me. Any change? Three, I passed out. <laughs> One, two, good, good. So Nika, yours I think was an eight originally. Yeah, so I said eight, and then you said one to 10. And I realized, okay, no, 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 I'm going the opposite end. So then I changed it to a five, but yes, oh, okay. no. So five, yeah. Three. Yeah. So yeah. You didn't notice the difference. Yeah. I yeah. feel, I feel, um, I feel more centered. I feel, you know, it's just, it's such a, a easy thing, you know, because you said it, it seems really simple, just breathing, breathing. And it seems like every time something happens, people are like, just breathe, just breathe. And you're like, does that really work? But no, when you really do <laughs> lean into that, you can tell that it just, it, I don't know what it does chemically, but it's like it releases something that allows you to kind of just oh, exhale. Yeah. Yeah, what it does yeah. from a scientific standpoint is that it calms the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's mm -hmm. why I said I do have to be intentional about which nostril, the left nostril, pressing down on it does something else to the brain. It affects the, ah. the sympathetic nervous system. So, but if you're wanting that, that calm, then you want to make sure you're doing the right nostril for the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, and also when you think about why this is important, um, you, when you think about it, when, when I get upset, what happens to my breathing? It, it oh, gets, yeah. it gets yeah. hot when I'm angry, what happens to my breathing? Mm -hmm. When I'm afraid, what happens to my breathing? So the reason we say breathe is because often people have stopped and held their breath and right. they're just reacting in the moment. And again, those breaths are really short. They're really shallow. And, and so once you start to really breathe deep from the diaphragm, your body is going to follow suit. There, there's a saying that I, that I also share that it's very difficult to deep breathe and stress out at the same time because your brain is going to have to choose and because it can't um it can't pay attention to two separate states at the same time it's going to follow what your body is doing and so if i'm upset and i'm you know really feeling triggered and and feeling like i'm about to send this email that i know is going to have you know repercussions mm -hmm. then take a moment go into a bathroom stall go sit in your car get away press down and just breathe. And if someone says, hey, what are you doing? What is that weird thing? Is it your allergies? You can share it with them. Hey, this is an incredible self-care mm -hmm. technique that I learned that keeps me from emotionally reacting and my amygdala 
hijacking me and causing me to, you know, to react in a, in an unprofessional way. I love that. And I love relationships as well. So before you love that out to your spouse, breathe. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah I'm gonna be walking around the house like this all the time he's gonna like, what's going on honey I'm just practicing a technique <laughs> no I love that and I love the idea of not shying away from a thing but really just saying this is what I'm doing and yeah I should maybe lean into it as well if you find that it can be helpful to you no that is great I love that Thank you. you know, and I think that some of these simple tactics and strategies, they need to find its way into the workplace, because when we talk about stress levels, that is where the majority of the stress sometimes can reside is in the workplace. And so I love that you're bringing this to to the conversation. Um, we're going to be shifting in a little bit, and I want to invite this audience to share their questions, their thoughts, their inquiries, or or perhaps you have something you want to contribute to this community. But I'll give you a chance to think about um, maybe what you want to to ask of Giovanna or perhaps um, maybe what you want to just contribute. But either way, you can unmute yourself and you can contribute live and I will spotlight you. Or if you prefer to just place your your commentary into the chat or your question into the chat, we'll make sure that we present that on your behalf. So I want to go to this next question while the audience are are thinking about that. Um, So you mentioned psych safety, and that's part of, of course, the work that you do. And I know that's really important when you're trying to create that level of rapport and trust and comfort when you are coaching someone, especially during the therapy sessions. And so what do you find as some of the most effective strategies to get people to really lean into those therapy sessions? Because what I'm mindful of is that there's still this stigma around therapy, right? And and I think that the more that we can allow people to realize that um, the professionals who offer this type of coaching and sessions, they, they are equipped to not only make sure that they are able to facilitate the session in a way that's useful in terms of results, but also just making people feel comfortable and unarmed about um, even having to have therapy in the first place. So can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah. um, In the therapy space, I I don't know. I I think, Nika, when I was eight years old, I would have adults telling me their personal business. I remember thinking to myself as a child, you do realize I'm a kid, right? (laughs) <laughs> um, so, so I don't know if I just had this natural gift or this natural ability that people just felt safe around me. They felt mm-hmm. safe opening up. So for me, I bring that to whatever interaction mm-hmm. or encounter that I'm having, whether again, that's in a therapy session or whether that's in the workspace I'm facilitating or I'm in the coaching setting. I just bring that part of me that lets people know it's safe, that you don't have to perform for me. You don't have to pretend there's no judgment. I'm impartial. I'm neutral. I am legally required to keep confidentiality. So this is a very safe space. And again, when you think about um, diversity and inclusion and belonging and that feeling of psychological safety, is it safe to be me? Is it safe for me to offer innovations? Is it safe for me to offer my opinion? opinion, even if I'm wrong, even if it doesn't work out, do I have that sense of safety that is safe for me to contribute the way I contribute? Because I can't contribute the way that Alfred Ramirez does it, the way that Karis does it. How is it that I contribute that's authentically me? And having that be, even if it's not understood, be respected. Because I often say we don't have to agree with one another in order to have um, understanding or empathy or to try to relate to where someone is coming from. And, And again, when you think about just inclusion and belonging and psychological safety, it goes hand in hand. The safer people feel in their work environment, in their organization, the more engaged they're going to be, the more they're going to feel empowered to contribute. Uh, And you don't know that one of those individuals who's afraid to raise their hand has the solution to whatever problem that you're facing or whatever that team, you know, is struggling with, that person can contribute something meaningful. Um, But a lot of times, again, we just size people up and and on site and we make assumptions and we have our biases implicit and unconscious. And we've already sort of told ourselves who this person is before sometimes people ever even open their mouths. And that people can sometimes sense and then they never open their mouth they never say the thing that might have shifted you know the the whole culture I was um doing a class I I'm a facilitator at BMW 
and I was with a class uh, a week or maybe a couple of weeks ago, and someone was talking about how him coming in from another company with a different culture, and he came into a particular department at BMW, and just the culture that he had put in, put up, you know, had come in with and brought with him began to shift the culture just within that yeah. department. And then once that culture yeah. began to shift in that department, guess what happened? It starts to become contagious. And I think that's how we begin to transform our, our company and organizational culture. Sometimes it just starts with one or two individuals or one small department or area. And then again, it infects everyone else, just like the flu or the coronavirus. Yeah. But we also have positive contagions, right? Um, and yeah. so, yeah. 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 The culture is about the people. So to your point, you could be influencing the culture positively and negatively, right? Yeah. We want to make sure that we're trying to ensure that the, uh, the toxins are not going to take over. And so it really, it really is important. Um, so um, Alfred has a question and I'm going to present his question. It was presented into the chat. So thank you for being here, Alfred. His question is Giovanna, what are your thoughts or experience around somatic therapy to treat PTSD? Mm and other mental and emotional health issues through the connection of mind and body, especially for BIPOC folks. Yeah, I love it because as I mentioned earlier, Alfred, it's so often we, we are either worried about the past or trying to focus on the future, plan for the future, worry about the future, which means that we're very often in our heads. And, and so part of uh, somatic therapy is helping us get back into our bodies. Nika, when you talked about how you felt more centered, you felt that in your body, not in your head. Your mind might have yeah. said this feeling is centered, but your body is what experience centered. Your mm -hmm. body is what experiences relaxation. But so many of us, especially us hyperachievers, we are always in our heads. We're always in our minds. So I think that the more we can practice being comfortable in our own skin, being comfortable in our own bodies, the more that's going to be able to just not only impact positively our mental health, our emotional health, our psychological health, our relationship health and certainly in the workspace so many incredible benefits and so as i um, continue to invite the audience for questions and comments i'm not seeing any hand raised right now or anything in the chat so i want to go to the next question and this is really keeping us um, on the point that we that was just raised when we consider mental health and how organizations are becoming much more intentional about trying to provide support services to their employees around mental health um what are you seeing as some of the most effective ways organizations are really leaning into that Honestly, again, I, I hate to say this, but I think 10 years ago, a Giovanna with a psychological background probably would not be doing leadership training. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that 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 is just one area. And because again, I do bring that understanding of human behavior with me and in helping people to be able to recognize that I literally, Nika, and I'm saying Nika, y'all, I recognize Dr. Nika, but I know her personally. She's a great yes. friend. Um, so, so, um, but but I recently was asked to come into a company, um, a company that that specializes in providing alarm systems. And they asked me to come in and teach them how to recognize when a fellow colleague isn't doing well. And, and they said, we don't wanna be therapists, but we just at least wanna be able to recognize it because when we even think about workplace violence, um, you know, you, yeah. you wanna be able to that, if I see someone just doesn't seem like they're doing well, especially if I've noticed they're typically like this or like that, you don't necessarily have to go get anyone's business. I'm not saying go to HR and report them. But having something in place where we can just, again, be a safe space for one another. So often, even in the workplace, people feel isolated, people feel excluded, and people feel rejected. And not always just based on race or based on gender or based on right. generation, but sometimes people just, they're different. They've had different background experiences, different cultural experiences. They have different political views. And so because of that, people will tend to isolate if they don't feel a part of something. And um, so yeah, just, just being able to have those open, genuine conversations sometimes with one another, I think is helpful. 
Yeah, so it increases and improves the communication and improves our ability to um, be more empathetic and show forth more compassion, which allows us to be more supportive of our colleagues, more of an ally standing in solidarity mm -hmm. and thinking about all of the, the benefits that you've brought to the conversation of, you know, organizations really trying to be innovative, like the company you just referenced and and, and helping um, them to, to just be able to know what does this look like? How can I recognize it? And then what can I do? I often say that I think also so the simple question of what does support look like for you being a really important question to engage our colleagues and our friends, our community members, whoever, because sometimes I think that we assume that we know or, or you know, what's wrong with someone and we start operating from that mindset and it could be something different and it may not even be an effective way to support someone. But Nika, it does, if I can and, jump in yeah, at this point, please. Say that, I, I literally have this come up and again, because I try to be authentic with myself first, I, I'm I'm willing to put the difficult conversations or the difficult topics out there. And so wow. I had a recent experience with someone um, in a training class or a facilitation space. And, mm -hmm. and she was talking about a colleague and then she referenced the colleague as an angry black woman. And mm -hmm. so what I suggested was, oftentimes the person you perceive as just angry might be anything but. They might be feeling insecure. They might be feeling anxiety. They might be worrying about something and it might just be plain old fear. And because we're not comfortable with our vulnerability, especially in the workspace, then we are going to default to an angry expression. And I see someone saying anger is a secondary emotion. Absolutely. Rarely yes. is anger the issue. Anger is typically just covering something up that's a deeper issue. Maybe I do feel mm -hmm. sad. Maybe I do feel excluded. Maybe I don't feel like I belong. Maybe I'm worried that I'm not going to be able to keep my job and how am I going to support my family? And so that kind of just becomes my demeanor, or my exterior. But if you never have a conversation with me, you're going to watch Walk around assuming, oh, there goes another angry black girl, an angry black woman, when there may be so many more layers to what I'm experiencing. And, and that's not just unique to just angry black. That can be applied to different, um, I think, different um, ethnicities and just certain people, you know, not even an ethnic thing, but just certain people. If we see people, you know, I'm a disc facilitator. So sometimes we mm -hmm. may see people that, that just have a different way of relating. They're not just in the world to piss you off they're not they're not breathing just to get under your skin they are having their own unique life experience just like all of us are doing so you know when we get into those assumptions that assumptions and biases I think we really do each other um a disservice yeah, no, I totally agree. I totally agree. And um, I'm having to to probably lean into some of those breathing exercises now because when you you know brought up the angry black woman trope, that is something that requires breathing <laughs> because you know, and many I'm sure that's part of this community because it's it's one of those things that um, can be really triggering to hear. It's it's so stereotypical and it's so misguided. So to your point and to my colleague's point who actually was sharing, that's a secondary emotion. There's always something behind a lot of those emotions, not even just anger, but emotions of fear and of concern. That's why I often say that part of being able to um, support someone is just being in tuned to the feel words that they use. I'm concerned. I'm worried. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sad. Absolutely. Those are those feel words are communicating something deeper, and that should be a sign of you know where you can. Let's try mm -hmm. to stand in in a moment of solidarity by by seeing if you you can be that support system and let them just kind of talk. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, that is that is that is really key. And one of the things that that we teach or that I teach as part is as part of leadership also is the use of as and as a coach powerful questions uh, you know in the therapy mm -hmm. space we call that something else we're like wait a minute they stole our technique in the in the corporate <laughs> environment but 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 you know powerful questions as you just said and those of us in leadership we are supposed to be recognizing those things and making sure that the people mm -hmm. entrusted to us the people that report to us that we are aware when we look at emotional intelligence part of emotional intelligence isn't just me and my own emotions it is how well I am at recognizing other people's emotions how well am I reading the room how well am I in tune to this situation that this particular individual who's usually very outgoing all of a sudden becomes sullen and withdrawn yeah. 
and I don't say, oh, they're just, you know, in a funk or, you know, they're just, they got a bad attitude. What else might be going beneath the surface? Some people are simply waiting for someone to see and hear them and just yes. ask the question. And then they'll be willing to open up because just asking the question sometimes says to me, I see you and you matter. It does. It does. Yeah. I often share that I think as a society, we spend way too much time making definitive statements based on assumptions, things that we thought that we knew, and not enough time asking thoughtful questions and just really being in this posture of receiving information, reflecting on it in, in a way that um you know, through that active listening, it, we're, we're breaking down bridges, right? We're helping to close those gaps. We're helping people to feel a deepened sense of belonging, which again, that word is coming back up because that is so important. It's so important for one's ability to perform well. It's so important for one's ability to feel a sense of accomplishment and achievement. And, you know, I often share that, you know, if someone's always questioning whether or not they belong, do I belong here? Am I seen? Am I valued? Am I heard? Do I have full opportunity for success? They're not showing up at their best. Mm -hmm. And so that in and of itself should give leaders pause, pause in a way to where they're saying, what do I need to be doing different? So what I really value about your approach, Giovanna, is that um, even when you're providing this level of um, facilitation and development for leaders, it is it is really bringing in those what I call power skills, not soft skills, but power skills, you know, the emotional intelligence, the how to look for certain signs so that you can be a much more effective listener and empathetic leader. All of that is so important and so needed right now in organizations. And so I'm glad to see um, this influx of, of, of additional um, support for this type of intersection to to the work of leaders development um and and you are kind of leading the way and paving the way and i'm just so grateful so what else is coming up for you that we haven't had a chance to talk about today that you wish to socialize with this podcast community oh i love that word socialize yeah i i stay busy <laughs> i i am definitely busy i'm doing a cohort right now um <clears throat> with a, a guy named uh, Shirzad who has come up with a concept called PQ or positive intelligence. So of course we have mm. IQ, we have EQ, but, but PQ. And what he talks about is that we all have this inner judge and, and from the psychological space, we call that the inner critic. So it's, it's the same things are just crossing those boundaries, but we all have this inner judge, especially people again, that are hyper achievers, high performers. You typically have this inner judge. A lot of people call it perfectionism. Um, but even when people aren't per perfectionists per se, yeah that we all just kind of have this inner critic, this inner judge that's constantly telling us what we're not doing enough of, how we're not performing up to par um, and comparing us to one another. Of course, we can also call it the, the ego um, if we want to just get very basic. But um, he also talks about how some people have these additional saboteurs and of course, saboteur being sabotaging. Um, but mm -hmm. some of those might be uh, the hyper achiever. It might be the people pleaser. Another one is the victim. Uh, everything is always happening to me. They're doing this right. to me. Um, there's the controller, which again comes in with that perfectionism and the controller feels very unsafe when the controller isn't in control. And so it likes to control situations. And I think we used to look at that as a virtue, sort of as a great thing. I can remember Nika people bragging about perfectionism and saying, oh yeah, I'm a perfectionist. And I would say, mm. wow, you'll be in my office eventually. And I'm, I'm just being real about that. 90, 95% of the people that I treat with depression are also perfectionists. I kid mm -hmm. you. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because they, they are never enough. They can never achieve enough. They can never do enough. They can never accomplish enough. They can never matter enough. And so there's this just pervasive um, going and achieving and doing and reaching and, and working towards and setting the next goal. And, and so this work is very um, interesting to me. Of course, it goes, there's a lot of evidence-based research behind it as well. I'm also getting ready to take a course in neurobiology and uh, which starts next month. So I, I'm pretty busy in addition to being a mom and having basketball games and 
softball getting ready to start and um you know being a wife and having my fur baby but but that's really what I have going going on I'm planning on bringing the brief women's conference back November 11th 11 11 so Nika I'll definitely share that information with you and um but but for now I just kind of have scaled back on some of my events that I typically host because I'm really working on developing me and more of my skill as I continue to navigate this corporate space that I'm now in. Okay, any other questions? I don't know if I have any uh, authority to, to click on anything. So, but- uh, uh, am I, uh, I had a quick question, Giovanna. What's the next book? Uh, wow, you did not ask me that, Terry. Um, <laughs> I get asked that quite a bit. And writing for me takes so much of my, my heart and energy and it's, it takes me a moment. And because my other one was released three years ago, I have the next one in mind, but I haven't sat down to actually start the writing process. So um, I will keep you posted. Thank you. Jim, I, I have a question. Sure. This is um, Sarah. I'm just curious, what, um, what classes do you teach at BMW? Um, I do Fit for Leadership, uh, which is for like, um, professional staff. And I also um, co-facilitate, well, actually I'm no longer a co-facilitator. I facilitate ILE. Um, and I did, oh. a, um, I taught a mentoring course for uh, the purchasing department as well. Okay. So I'm in the purchasing department here at BMW. So I was just trying to figure out which class I needed to take to, oh, uh, to get in on. But the ILE courses, they're only for management. I am in the mentoring program but I think that was more so for the management that will be leading the mentoring program um, in the purchasing department so I'll actually, try to do the one for the professional band then actually Sarah the the mentorship is supposed to be um it's not exclusive it's supposed to be inclusive oh. so it's not based on management level or anything like that you you should just reach out to Nikki in um T865 yeah, so I think we're the guinea pig to the launch of that mentoring program yeah. then. <laughs> and yeah, so I'm yeah, I'm I'm a yeah, I'm a part of that guinea pig. <laughs> but thank you. And unfortunately, we're out of time. But Giovanni, I just want you to know how much I really appreciate you being here sharing with us. We're going to make sure we share into the chat ways in which people can get a hold of you. And so your LinkedIn and others, I'm going to ask my colleagues um, to place that into the chat. I want to give you the final words as you close us out, but we truly are grateful. Thank you so much. And again, thank you for having me, um, Nika. But GiovannaGethers.com, and obviously you can see the spelling of my name, which I often have to spell mm -hmm. for people, but GiovannaGethers.com is probably the easiest, simplest way. Um, I also have a website for Touchstone, touchstone-counseling.org. Touchstone um, my phone number, 864-619-1559. And then I'm also on, thank you, Amora. I'm also on social media, Facebook, Giovanna Gathers, um, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, I am Giovanna Gathers. I, I'm on Twitter, but I don't tweet. So don't try to connect with me there. <laughs> I can't manage all that. All right. <laughs> I know it's a lot. It really is a lot. Well, we're grateful. There's so many ways in which we can connect with you. And so I hope this community will definitely reach out because there's a wealth of additional knowledge and resources I know that you can can provide. And again, we're just grateful, my friend. And so thank, thank you. you for saying yes to our invitation. Wishing you all a wonderful and safe weekend. And we look forward to seeing you back here next Friday, same time, 11 um, a.m. Eastern Standard for Intentional um, Conversations podcast. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.